Davina Bell is an award-winning author of books for children and young adults of all ages. You'll know her picture books, Under the Love Umbrella, all of the factors why I love tractors. I love the title of that book. And of course, all the ways to be smart. And of course, a brand new young adult novel, which we're going to talk about now. Davina is also an editor and a coffee addict. Davina, I hope you've had your coffee before you chat. How are you? Hi, Sue. I've actually had two, so I'm feeling very peppy. Thanks so much. Good, because I'll keep your energy going. You'll need it. <laughs> Dear, I know you're an editor as well as a writer. What came first for you? Oh, that is an interesting question. Uh, everyone who knows me from when I was small say that I was always going to be a writer from when I was a really small child. Um, but I actually, I, and I loved writing stories as a kid, but I got to be about 12 and thought, well, that's not a legitimate profession. So I studied law and politics at uni and I was terrible at it. Um, and I got to the end of five years and I thought, can't be a lawyer. My clients would all end up in jail. So what can I do instead? And I moved over to Melbourne from Perth, where I grew up, um, to study professional writing and editing at RMIT, thinking that I would write a novel. Um, but I was so intimidated by the first novel writing class. There were so many professional people who'd had novels sitting in their drawers or I'd written six drafts or they all seemed very grown up and worldly from me coming over from Perth. Um, and I was so frightened by that class, I quit and I really got into the editing. So I had written a few short stories as part of that course that got published. Um, but I started working as an editor um, in the children's book department at Penguin on a maternity leave contract. Um, and it was while I was there working there um, that my short stories got published and my publisher, my boss there actually read them and they had child protagonists in them. And she said, oh, have you ever thought about writing for children? And I, it had always actually been a dream of mine. Um, since in my uni days, I was a nanny and I worked with children with autism and I read a lot of books to them. I really love children's literature always. So um, I was an editor, working as an editor when she kind of tapped me on the shoulder um, and said, oh, give it a try. We don't have to show anyone if it's terrible. And from there, that's when my writing career began. So it was kind of a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B and one kind of led to the other through um, my uh, publisher, Jane Godwin, who is also actually an author as well in her own right. I think you've interviewed us. It, it's that amazing that it's someone's faith in you, someone recognising you, that you can do it, that you go, all right, I'll give it a go. It's like it um, gives you permission. Absolutely. And she, everyone who's met her would know she's such a warm and nurturing person. And I just had so much trust in her in the way that I probably wouldn't have had to show anybody else my writing at that stage. I was so shy and introverted and um, so, I think, so protective of the idea that it could be really terrible. I don't think I would have shown anyone but Jane. So I feel so blessed and lucky that, that she came into my life. I don't think I would have my life as it is without, without her. When you talk about nannying, because as soon as you said working with nanny, I could just see absolutely where books like um, all the tractor factors, well, I love tractors, and also all the ways to be smart, I can see where they've come from. How much do you think those kids influenced what you're writing? Oh, hugely. So fascinating. So as I mentioned, I was so terrible at university and I would just attend the bare minimum. And to support myself, um, I nannied or was a um, therapist for autistic children for um, seven different families. And there was a family with three really naughty boys. There was a family with four really rowdy sisters. Um, there was a family who I looked after um, from when they were really tiny up to when they're in primary school. And they sort of, sort of, grew up with them. Um, and a little guy who started off, I started looking after him when he was four months old um, and I left to come to Melbourne when he was five. So I feel like I saw his whole life. And those kids, the time I spent with them and just sort of being in that world, I was so much more in the world of children than adults for the whole of my late teens and early twenties. And I feel like those experiences and really the micro dramas of being a child, the tiny joys and the tiny sorrows and the anger and the wildness and all that kind of landscape of childhood really sank into me in, in a really deep way. And it was a time when I was so, I'd come from a really academic school and I was really used to studying a lot and kind of being the best in all the tests. And I had really harnessed, put a lot of my identity into being a smart person. Um, and I got to university and I wasn't good and I really struggled and I had a real crisis of identity, which has actually ended up becoming the book All The Ways To Be Smart. I sort of wrote that for myself at that time, I think, when I was 
figuring out that there was more to being a person than just being an intelligent person who does well in tests. Um, so I think at that time in my life, I was really grappling a lot with questions in the adult world and I took a lot of shelter in the world of the child. And I think those kids and, and their stories and sort of the little, just the little details of their lives and their emotional lives has really um, sat with me. And as a editor, as a writer, I'm, I feel like I'm always trying to come from the perspective of what a child would take from a book and how it might shape them or how it might bring them comfort or wonder or joy. You did, you started off junior fiction and your picture books, but you've kind of taken um, a, not a big step, but it's a whole different world, young adult writing. How did you find that change? I found it incredibly liberating, I think. But this book, um, The End of the World is Bigger Than Love, I actually started writing it before a lot of my other books came oh. out. So the only books that I had written were the Our Australian Girl books, the Alice books in Our Australian Girl series, um, which were about a ballerina growing up in World War I. And those books required an incredible amount of research and there was a real series tone to them. And um, the vocab had to be at a really specific level for sort of middle primary. And so there were a lot of constraints around those books. And I loved writing them and I was really into the world of them. But when I finished, I sort of had the feeling that I wanted to break through and free and write something really wild and different and innovative. And I think you can really see it, that that is what has translated into the end of the world is bigger than love because it is a sort of genre bending book and it's got two unreliable narrators and goes back and forth in time and across the world and it's set in the future and it's very complicated. And I feel like that you can almost kind of see me reveling in the fact that I don't have any constraints on me almost to the point where it went too far and it became just like a horse that had bolted that I was trying to ride. <laughs> wrangle it all in together there are so many different elements of it and it was so so difficult to write just because I feel like I set myself an incredibly high level of difficulty um, so I think yeah I felt I found it very freeing and very um, very it was a really rich experience it was mm -hmm. a really a really deep personal rich experience in the way that um, writing for all other age groups wasn't has never quite been as deeply personal as this one I can't begin to imagine where it started because, as you say, it's so complex and it covers everything from talking whales to incredible mountains that just freak you out. Where did the spark come from? Where did it start? I have always been obsessed with twins. Ever since I was a tiny, tiny child, I've been completely fascinated by twins and the world of a twin and and what it must be like to have someone who almost is a half of you that you're kind of forever connected with, but probably forever pushing away from and where, how your identity is shaped by their identity. And that just has always it's been a lifelong fascination. So I'm not surprised that I picked twin twins as the narrators of this, the narrator of this book. Um, and then a lot of the story is set in a global pandemic. And I was thinking the other day, why did I do that? I'm not a sci-fi reader. It's really out of character for me. And I had been puzzling over it because this book came out in June, so about two months into the pandemic, but I had started writing eight years before. And then I was Googling, everyone had been talking about the Spanish flu. And, I, and my friend asked me on the phone one day, how did the Spanish flu end? And I thought, that's a really interesting question. And I had studied the Spanish flu as part of the Our Australian Girl books in World War I. And so I Googled how did Spanish flu end? And I was skimming an article about the Spanish flu. And there was this detail that I remember reading about when I was doing that research all those years ago. And it was that when people got the Spanish flu, some of them turned blue and died in one day. And I just remember that just for some reason that fascinated me. And that little spark of an idea about a pandemic where you change color and you die. Um, that became the graying, which is the pandemic in my book. So it was part of doing that research for around World War I. It was part of my fascination with twins. And then I suppose the back and forth in time and the different places, I don't know, I think I was, a lot of the book is about love and it's about love between siblings, between parents. It's got a romantic love story and it's sort of about self-forgiveness and self-compassion and I suppose it how do you keep on loving yourself when you've done something unforgivable? So I guess I kind of mashed up those ideas with different times and places. And from there, I wrote it in really small chunks, really separate chunks. And then I would move them around and put them together and, and write bits that came in between and, and 
up until it almost went to print, I was moving these, all these disparate little chunks around to make a, to make a narrative. I had a lot of post-it notes and I would move them around on a wall. Um, so I think it came from just following things I loved and was passionate about and interested in. And I really, I just put in everything I've ever loved. So um, phosphorescence in water. I've always loved the side of phosphorescence in water. And Frank, Bon Maman Jam, um, Blue Whales. Just, it was just like the contents of my heart and my, and my curiosity and all my passions just thrown in all together in this kind of big jumble that I then kind of had to search through. It is, when you say a jumble, to read it, it's not a jumble, but it kind of is because there's so much in there, but it is so beautiful. Did you ever get the feeling that the horse had bolted, you know, that you were herding cats and I just have to give this away? Oh, so many times, Sue, I can't even tell you, because it is on the, on the blurb on the back, my editor, as part of the blurb wrote, it's like nothing you've ever read before. And as I was writing it, I was aware that it was really strange and weird and different and that it probably was going to alienate a lot of people. And it was so complex and so dense. And I would frequently lose my way in which part of information I had revealed at which time, because as a reader, it's two unreliable narrators. So you're constantly trying to figure out which one's telling the truth, who is real in this story. Um, and a lot of that is done by little, little drips of information at certain times. And if I left the book for more than a few days, I would come back and I'd be completely lost and I'd pull out my post-it notes again and I'd think, what is, are they in Turkey now? Are they in Tokyo? Is there internet? Is there no internet? It, it really was really hard to hold tight to. But if I worked it on it enough days in a row and really focused and really got lost in the dreamscape of the world, I would feel really confident and strong in the story. But as soon as I showed it to anyone or um, thought about it being published, I would lose that confidence. So it was just eight years, a few of which it was just on my hard drive, just I couldn't even look at it. I felt like it was such a failure. Um, and then coming back to it and editing it with an amazing editor at text, it was such a, um, just an ebb and flow of confidence and nervousness and despair and drama, um, like, like nothing I've ever experienced, but then, how it all came together right at the end was felt like just like a gift from another realm that mm. kind of just all dropped in together. What was the turning point where you actually went, I have got this? It wasn't until the last round when I reordered it for the final time. And uh, it's hard to talk about without. Um, yes, I know. <laughs> but there, were, there was just a point where I realised I could I could order the second half of one of the narrators, the narrator Winter. Mm -hmm. I realised that if I put her story in a certain order, the reader would be able to figure out a certain line of um, logic. And that was honestly like, the, it had been laid out in pages, it had been proofread. Like it was really, really far towards the end of the novel. That was That was the point where I thought, this is as good as it can be. And this is what I, had hoped that it could be. And I can't do anything more now. I can't do better than this. But up until then, I think even my editor was a tiny bit nervous that, because it was really hard to make sense of because it does jump around so much and it goes back and forth between the two girls' narrations. Um, there was a real knife point where we both weren't sure if we could pull it off. So it really, so it was literally probably three days before it went to print. How important for you is that, um, and I'm assuming you have a supportive writing group of friends that critique and help you? Oh, so I showed this book to um, six people at various times um, before I entered it into the text prize. And three of them really hated it, like really didn't like it at all. Um, one of them was someone I had paid to give a reader's report and they could not have been more scathing. They, they said basically at the end, I'm not sure what you're trying to do, but you haven't achieved it. And they really cut through, they hated the voice, they didn't get the plot, they thought a lot of it was silly, overblown, overwritten. And in some ways, it, it kind of is overwritten in a way. Summer's narration is very verbose and chatty. And I'd sort of kind of tried to do that deliberately to contrast with Winter's really quiet spare narration. But she hated all that. So I had, I had three people who either really didn't like it, found it very confusing, said they didn't know who it was for, um, found it very grim. And then I had three people who said, oh, my gosh, it's so original. I really love it. Um, 
I, I couldn't put it down. I read it all the way to the like end in one sitting and who were so, um, seemed to be quite invigorated by it. And the whole time I was in this, I felt torn apart between the really positive feedback and the really negative feedback. And they were so far apart. Um, so when it came to, I didn't know what to do with it and it sat on my computer for about two or three years. Um, and I entered it into the text prize anonymously because I thought I'm a book editor if this really is as bad as half these people say I'm going to ruin my reputation if I submit something that's just so incredibly terribly written so I wrote it um, I entered it in under a pseudonym and um, I think it was only the confidence from those three other readers that led me to be able to do that and then before it went to um, print a couple of other of my friends read it and they um, they was so enthusiastic and really seemed to understand what I was trying to do. And that gave me the confidence to get it over the line. But without those, you really, when you're a novelist, you really need those little sparks of input. Otherwise it's just you in this giant echo chamber of your own doubt. And it's so hard to get beyond that. So I think having, having supportive readers, having people whose opinion you really trust and who you feel you understand their aesthetic and they understand you as a writer. It's, I think one of the greatest gifts of being a writer is having those people in your life and the chance to be that person for other people as well. It's not just, oh, you're doing well. It's, it's much more trusting. Absolutely. And um, that someone is willing to engage with the nuance of it and the gritty details and they're willing to pull separate bits apart and say, what did you mean by this? Or um, this made me think about this or have you considered this? And to really like hold it up to the light and look at it from lots of different angles. I think that's such a gift to have someone do that for your work. Davina, one of the things that stands out to me, not just in the way that the end of the world is written, but even in just, you know, you getting to that course, moving from Western Australia to Melbourne, getting to the course and going, oh God, I'm going to editing, is courage. Like, even when you felt fear and gone, yeah, no, nah, this isn't going to work, you've kept going. What is it if it makes you keep going? That is so interesting, Sue, because I often feel like, am I just a really am I a huge coward because I find writing so fear inducing and I feel like I'm always acting from a place of fear rather than a place of courage but I suppose I do keep going and I feel it it is because when I am writing and when I'm really in a project it feels like it's not from me it honestly feels like it comes from another another world or another mind and I'm just I'm just transcribing it um, so, for example, my picture book, Under the Love Umbrella, literally that came to me as I was riding a subway car across the Williamsburg Bridge in New York. And I literally heard, with the rhythm of the subway, I heard the words to that book. And I didn't have a notebook or anything. I was um, going shopping in Soho with a friend for the day. And so I only had a napkin. And so I pulled out the napkin and I just wrote what I heard that was the rhythm of the train and those words together. And I followed my friend all around Soho while she shopped and I just wrote for like an hour and a half and then we stopped for lunch and I read it to her and that was the book that is how the book is in the finished copy so I feel like there are moments like that when I feel like I have to keep going because it's not it's not me it's coming through me or I'm a conduit for these books and stories and it's my responsibility to show up for those so I really I don't know if I believe in a divine power but it feels like there's something about me and books in the world that I feel like that's a gift I just keep having to show up for even though I find writing so I don't find the actual writing hard but making myself do it is so difficult for me I'm not a disciplined person who gets at their desk at 5 a.m every morning or has writes a thousand words a day I really struggle if I don't have a deadline and I think a lot of that is because I'm afraid it's not going to be good and I read people's writing all day as part of my publishing job and I know, I know how bad it can be. Like I know what bad writing is and I live in the fear that that is me and that's my writing. So I feel like it's this constant um, pull between those two things, the feeling like this is something you need to pursue because it's, you're lucky enough to have that given to you versus what if it is as bad as everybody, like lots of the people's work who think that their work is fantastic and maybe am I, how am I any different from those people who say, oh, I'm going to write a book in an afternoon and my grandchild loves this rhyming picture book that I wrote about my dog. <laughs> and I think, how am I different from that person? So it's those competing forces all the time. And I don't feel like I'm particularly courageous, but I guess I just keep going. When you were young, what were the books that you loved to read? Oh, so many. I read so voraciously as a child. I would just read anything. So 
uh, I grew up in the 80s, so it was a lot of Judy Bloom and the Bridge of Terabithia, and I wrote, I read every Enid Blyton. I read uh, Seven Little Australians and Plain Beady Bow and all those kind of Australian classics. Um, and I read, I read basically whatever I could get my hands on. So I read all my parents' books and they had sort of quite eclectic taste. They loved, my dad loved biographies. So I read a lot of biographies growing up of sailors and people who'd sailed around the world and politicians and English politicians. And um, my favourite, my favourite, one of my favourite books as a child was A Year in Provence, which is oh. a really odd thing for an 11 year old to love, but I was just obsessed with A Year in Provence. Um, a lot of the books that are actually in The End of the World is Bigger Than Love were the ones that I loved as a child and a young person. And I always remember being on holiday on a winter holiday, a really rainy holiday down in the southwest of um, WA, and my sister reading The Secret Garden to me, and she's a really good, um, she's a very good mimic, and she did the most amazing Yorkshire accent. And I feel like um, that was a moment of my childhood where I really felt close to her, because she was quite a lot older than me, but she sat and, and the rain on the roof read me The Secret Garden. So that's why a lot of the books that are in The End of the World is Bigger Than Love. It's sort of a love, a love song to the books I loved as a kid. So The Secret Garden is in there and Oliver Twist. And um, it was so interesting. So I laid them all out on my table to take a photo for Instagram saying, these are all the books that are referenced in this book that I'm about to publish as sort of pre-publicity thing. And I looked down and I realised they're all written by white people. I did not seem oh. to have, I did not read a writer of colour, my whole childhood, it seemed, from these books. And I almost felt embarrassed by that. And I thought, what a sign of the times that now that is striking, but back then it was so incredibly normal. Mm. And I sort of feel like this was after the book had been published and I thought, should I have gone back and put in, if I had had the chance, should I have gone back and put in writers of colour, writers from different backgrounds? But then the idea is that the books that, that are read, the girls read in the story, are their mum's favourite books from her childhood. And I had imagined she probably would have grown up in a similar time to me because it's said in the future. Um, so I've really wrestled with that since Sue and thought, mm. if, if I had the chance to do it over, how should I have done that? And yeah, leading children to those books. I'm imagining if young adults read my novel and want to go back and read those books, am I only directing them to like a really specific part of the canon? So that has been a really interesting thing I've wrestled with. Now, on your website, I noticed, you know, your love of American things and being in New York. What is it about the Amish people that fascinates you? So, do you think I would really love to live a life with no technology? I feel so torn up and burdened by thinking I should be putting things on Instagram to promote my books. I should be answering emails. I should be looking at Twitter and looking what other publishers are doing. And I think I feel... I the simplicity of an Amish life really appeals to me and sort of the my life has so little routine in it because well in pre-pandemic times I would often travel and talk in schools and be into stage and then be balancing that with um, my publishing house job and and writing deadlines and I feel like it doesn't have a rhythm to it and it's very divorced from the world and the seasons and nature and I feel like living as an Amish person you'd be so in touch Maybe I'm romanticising it, but I think you've really been touched with the way the world turns and, and the earth and the seasons and being outside and just being free of, I just feel email is this, is this giant sled that I'm pulling along behind me all the time. The burdens of all the things I haven't responded to or people who sent me their work to look at or people who want, you know, information of, your bio because they're putting you in a program or all these things that are individually really necessary and often interesting but I I feel like the psychic burden of that for me is very high and so I think it's the simplicity the lack of technology being with nature and also I feel like um there's something so I don't know being part of a people who are such a minority in the world there must be such a strong sense of identity and community that I don't have just being a white middle-class woman in publishing I don't feel like that's and my family are all different in different parts of Australia and they're overseas and um, I don't live where I grew up so I feel like it must be something about that really strong sense of belonging that really appeals to me that I don't don't have as much in my own life. 
And I totally hear you about email. Sometimes you feel like your days are just catch up. It's just that you, you look at your empty inbox and go, yes. And about five minutes later, oh no. Yes. And you neglect it for a couple of days and then it just exponentially multiplies like a mushroom. Divina, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you, particularly after knowing your book so well and being familiar with them. So many questions I really want to ask about the end of the world is bigger than love, but that would be mean to people who haven't read it. So I'm not going to. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me, Sue. And it's such a gift to be able to talk about your books with someone who's interested. So thank you so much um, for the opportunity. And thanks for everything you do for authors in promoting their work. It's such a beautiful thing to do for the world. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you.